So let's look at what DNA is then. Um, DNA or is a nucleic acid, and so I shouldn't say just DNA, but nucleic acids include your DNA, your RNA, and your ATP. And so we all know ATP is the energy currency of our cells. DNA is the genetic information that is heritable, and it codes for proteins. And then RNA is the workhorse that actually produces those proteins. So nucleic acids are composed of what we call nucleotides. Those are the monomers. And a nucleotide contains a nitrogenous base. So this would be a type of base. A sugar, um, for DNA it's deoxyribose. For RNA it would be ribose. And then a phosphate group, okay? Um, the nitrogenous bases that we have, there are two that are called purines. These are double rings. Um, adenine and guanine are your purines. And then we have three pyrimidines. Pyrimidines are um, a single ring, and they consist of your cytosine, thymine, and then uracil, which is only found in RNA. Well, I should say thymine, which is only found in DNA as well. Um, they complementary pair to each other. And so we always have a purine pairing with a pyrimidine. So purine and pyrimidine. And adenine always binds with thymine or uracil, depending on if you're looking at DNA or RNA. And guanine always binds with cytosine. So between adenine and thymine, we have a two hydrogen bonds. Um, if we're producing uracil, you would also have those two hydrogen bonds. In guanine and cytosine, there's three hydrogen bonds that bond them together. Um, the nucleotides then are linked to each other. Um, the five prime end to a three prime hydroxyl. So a five prime phosphate to a three prime hydroxyl group. And this linkage is a covalent bond known as a phosphodiester bond. And we always link, um, DNA runs in a five prime to three prime direction. We always link to that three prime end. So how do we discover what DNA looks like? Now we know DNA is the genetic material and once we really figured that out, we started rushing to try and figure out what does DNA look like. So there's a lot of players that helped in the discovery of the DNA double helix. So Shargoth is one of the individuals um, that discovered that, ooh, sorry, um, discovered that nucleotides, that in all species we had varied numbers of nucleotides, but he always noticed that the number of adenine was very similar to the amount of thymine. Cytosine and guanine were similar to each other. But in each group, you might have, um, in one organism, you might have more guanine and cytosine. In another, you might have more thymine and adenine. So he's the one who came up with the linkage um, that adenine and thymine always bond together and you have equal or equivalent amounts of adenine and thymine, and then cytosine and guanine. And these, this is known as Shargoff's rules. Then Rosalind Franklin um, used x-ray diffraction to identify the double helical structure of the DNA. And so that's what this is. Um, she worked in a lab, and she had a partner, a lab partner, so another person that worked in the same lab. They didn't always work together, but they were, they were partners. Um, Watts, no, not Watson. Hold on, I'm going to check for the name. Uh, so it was Wilkins that worked in the same lab as her, and um, he actually received a Nobel Prize. Um, Rosalind Franklin should have also received that Nobel Prize, but she had died before the Nobel Prize was given. But her, her um, x-ray diffraction and Chargaff's rules helped Watson and Crick to actually 
identify the structure of the DNA. And so this is um, James Watson and Francis Crick. And they were looking at the structure of the DNA molecule. They built a structure and they are the ones that um, gain the majority of the credit. But there was a lot of players, like I said. Um, Wilkins is the one who gave um, Watson and Crick the x-ray diffraction, so the picture of what the DNA looked like. Um, he did it behind Rosalind Franklin's back, so that was kind of a, uh, an underhanded thing to do. Um, but he thought, hey, you know, we're researchers, we need to work together. That was his thought, and that's still his thought today. Um, Rosalind Franklin had no desire to work with these two, though. Um, so when Frank, or when um, Watson and Crick got a hold of her X-ray diffraction, and they used Chargaff's rules, they were able to make the double helix. And so the three, Watson, Crick, and um, Wilkins, were the individuals that actually received a Nobel Prize for the discovery of DNA, uh, the discovery of the structure of DNA. Um, and I believe that was in 1962. Um, so they get their Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And so this is what the structure of DNA looks like. I'll, I'm just going to quickly go through and show you. Adenine always binds with thymine. Cytosine and guanine are always bound together. Two hydrogen bonds here, three hydrogen bonds here. The... Um, the rungs of the ladder then, or the outside of the ladder, I don't know what you call that, the sides of the ladder, are composed of sugar and phosphate. So the sugar is called deoxyribose. And so you'd have a deoxyribose um, and a phosphate, a deoxyribose and a phosphate, a deoxyribose and a phosphate, um, all the way down. Uh, and these are covalently bonded to each other, each of the nucleotides, via a phosphodiester bond. So if you notice, here we have a three prime end and there's a five prime end. Over here we have a five prime end and a three prime end. So it's anti-parallel to itself. So one strand, it's a double helix. Um, one strand is going to run in the opposite direction of the other strand. So what is DNA then? DNA actually stores the genetic information that is used to carry out protein synthesis. So DNA basically stores the information for all the proteins that make up who we are. Um, and it's the transmissible information, so it's heritable um, from parent to offspring. And the sugar that we use, again, like I said, is deoxyribose, and then the, the four bases in DNA are adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Um, the strands are double, double, it's double stranded. Um, they're complementary to each other. So adenine and thymine always bond together. Guanine and cytosine always bond together. They run anti-parallel. So one, one, um, rung or one side will run from five to three prime. The other one will be running in a three to five. So they'll, they run in the opposite directions, basically. Um, always. This one's going downwards. This one's going upwards. But if you're looking, there's five, and then there's a three prime right there. Um, the term denaturation, which you have learned in, for proteins, um, means to take a protein and change its structure um, by heat or, or some chemical or by change in pH that causes the protein to no longer be functioning. In DNA, when we say denature, we're meaning that we're breaking those hydrogen bonds. So here you see um, the adenine and thymine bound together, cytosine and guanine bound together, and here they are broke apart. So that would be a denatured DNA strand. And then they can re-anneal together, okay? Typically, denaturation occurs when you heat the DNA up, and if you cool it, then it can re-anneal or re-nature. Re so what is RNA then. RNA is the um, 
nucleic acid that actually produces protein. So it participates in the process of protein synthesis. Whereas DNA carries the information, RNA is the workhorse. It's a single-stranded molecule. It contains a pentose sugar called a ribose. And the bases of RNA are adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil. So there's no thymine. We have a uracil instead. Um, this is RNA. Here's DNA. So you can see DNA is double-stranded. RNA is single-stranded. So when we are going to use DNA to make our RNA, we have to denature the DNA. Then we produce an RNA, which can bind to the template strand, and then it moves away. And now we have that single-stranded RNA molecule. There are three types of RNA. We have messenger RNA, which carries the, the information of the DNA in a, an RNA format. We have transfer RNA. So these are transfer RNAs that carry amino acids and they help in transferring those amino acids to the growing polypeptide. A polypeptide is that primary form of a protein. And then we have the, R, the ribosomal RNA, which is actually where proteins get formed. And it's found in two subunits. So here we have the different um, types of RNA. And here are the functions of those RNAs. So, hold on a second. So the last part of this, this chapter, I'm just going to go over a few terms. And then in chapter 11, we'll get into um, how DNA replicates, protein synthesis, um, mutations, all the fun stuff, okay? Well, we talked about some fun stuff here when we were talking about the history. but um, So the genome, then, is the entire genetic information of a cell or of an organism. So every single nucleus typically c contains the entire genome. Um, in bacteria, the nucleoid region is going to contain the entire genome in general. Um, genes then are segments of DNA that code for proteins. And these genes then can be expressed when we produce or are expressed when we produce those proteins. Um, a genotype is a specific collection, hold on, I'm sorry. Um, a genotype is a specific collection of genes that a cell has. So it'd be like um, the genes that code for hair would be part of that genotype. Phenotype are the characteristics that the genotype gives. So like um, if you have a genotype of say a big B and a little b, and big B codes for dark hair, little b is for lighter hair, um, but big B is dominant, then your phenotype would be that dark hair color. Um, and then chromosomes are the organized structure of a DNA. So they are when DNA is packed together, it forms what we call a chromosome. When it is in its loose form, where it can actually um, produce proteins, it's in a form called chromatin. So prokaryotic organisms typically are haploid, which means they only have one chromosome. In general, all bacteria are single, have one single chromosome, and that single chromosome is going to be what they express then. Whereas eukaryotic organisms can be, and oftentimes are, diploid, which means they have two copies of a chromosome. And that means that they don't always express what their chromosome says. So um, an example would be if you have a chromosome that has a um, mutation for color blindness, but you have another chromosome that has normal color vision, then you're going to express normal color vision, but you can pass on your color blindness to your child. Um, and that's what happens oftentimes in um, to males because um, the color vision chromosome is on the X chromosome, whereas females have two X chromosomes, so we can carry a normal and a colorblind chromosome um, or gene, 
males only have one. So if a mom has a normal and a colorblind mutation, uh, mom can pass on the colorblind mutation um, X chromosome or the normal one, and the child will express whatever they have. Um, prokaryotic organisms typically have a circular chromosome that's found in the nucleoid carry, that carries everything, whereas eukaryotes have linear chromosomes that are found in the, in the nucleus. Um, chromosomes are typically supercoiled and packed very tightly with proteins called histone proteins. Um, so I should say that um, eukaryotes and archaea use histones. Bacteria use a different protein, but they have the same function. So they still protein, um, they still function in um, supercoiling that DNA so that it can fit in the nucleoid or in the d um, nucleus of the cell. So in eukaryotic organisms, not so much in prokaryotes, there are regions of DNA that don't code for proteins. So these non-coding regions are going to function um, oftentimes in, in other ways. Um, we don't know as much about the non-coding portions of DNA as we do the coding portions. All the coding portions we tend to study because they code for proteins and we want to know what happens if there's a mutation in that protein. Does it cause you to be colorblind or does it cause you to um, have a unique characteristic? You know, if, if we turn this off or turn this on, this mutation, then are you going to be glow in the dark? Stuff like that, right? So we're always interested in messing with those genes, but the non-coding region we haven't done as much um, research in. So we don't know as much about the non-coding reading regions, but in general, we find the majority of non-coding DNA is found in eukaryotic organisms. Very little, if any, is found in prokaryotic organisms, mainly the areas that are going to code for like start protein synthesis. Those are the only non-coding areas in a prokaryotic organism. So I typically just say that the non-coding regions are found in eukaryotes, not prokaryotes, because they don't code for a protein, but they start the protein synthesis, so they're kind of just as important. Um, we do know that there are there is likely going to be some um, non-coding DNA that functions in helping to maintain chromosomal structure. So we have that much information about the non-coding portions. I think that is it. So I'm going to stop this video. It's only been 17 minutes, so it's not too long. And I'll get into chapter 11 a little bit later. Bye.